Amazing things are coming to light these days. It's the end times, and we're going to talk about some things that you won't believe. And here to talk about those things, which I hope by the end of this program you will believe, is Timothy Alberino. Timothy, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Gary. Great to be back. Can I call you Tim? Of course. All right. You can call me Gary. And we're going to be talking about, among other things, the contents of this DVD. It's called True Legends Part 2, The Unholy Sea. There's so much going on now, Tim, and you're really out there at the forefront of discovery. Uh, there are so many hidden, secret sorts of things that are coming to light these days. I can't help but believe that we're living in the last days, just before, uh, if you will, all hell breaks loose. Uh, we're seeing the dark side in a way that we've never seen it before, and you've explored some really interesting areas in the world. We have. Our latest film, uh, our latest edition of our True Legends documentary series, Episode 2, The Unholy Sea, we feature three separate locations. We're in Peru, and Cusco specifically. We're in Malta, on the island of Malta. And we're in Rome, we're in Italy. And in all three places you produce evidence of the ancient world that's, that's right. been covered over. Uh, when I pick up my Bible, I look at Genesis 6, that familiar passage uh, in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Uh, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. I can remember 30, 40 years ago you could read that verse and it would just go right by. Nobody would just think. Just gloss right over it. It was just glossed over. Not anymore because too much is coming to light and you, you're, you're finding a lot of that's that. That's right and you can't gloss over it anymore because in my estimation in order to understand the prophetic future, we have to understand the prehistoric past, specifically as it relates to the world before the flood of Noah and the activities that were taking place on the earth related not only to the human race but also to the fallen angels and their hybrid offspring, including the giants. There are artifacts all over this world that people look at and say, ho-hum. And yet when you really look at them, you can't imagine how they were built. In fact, uh, in part one of True Legends, uh, you, you talked about some constructions uh, in South America where entire large fields had been crafted into what from the air looks like language almost or dots and dashes or letters. That's right. And when you get down to the ground and look at those things, it, you'd have to ex excavate tons and miles of rock to do this. Yeah, it would, have, it would be an un unimaginable task. And what you're referring to is called the Geoglyphs of Tiwanaku. There was an article written in 2012 by the late David Flynn, researcher David Flynn, an author. And uh, he was playing around with the newly developed Google Earth programs. And uh, when all that stuff was first coming online where you could really see high-res images of the surface of the Earth. And while looking around the area of Tiwanaku, which is very interesting because Tiwanaku is, is, uh, is linked uh, the coordinates of Tiwanaku, the geo-coordinates of Tiwanaku are directly linked with some other very interesting places around the world, especially other megalithic sites. And so Flynn had an interest in this and he was looking at it. And he discovered, as he's looking at these high-res satellite images of the region of Tiwanaku in Bolivia, uh, around Lake Titicaca, he discovered these, these massive geoglyphs. And uh, these things span for hundreds of miles and mm -hmm. they're basically, and we cover this in the first episode of our film, uh, we show you extensively what the, what the geo geoglyphs look like, and we give you our opinion on what the geoglyphs might be. And a geoglyph meaning writing in the earth, glyph being a... a exactly. A, so, exactly. so earth writing, but in huge scale. Right, and, the, and it looks something like Morse code with dots mm -hmm. and lines and square boxes and circles and all different kinds of shapes uh, that are both raised mounds and also are engraved into the bedrock of the earth. And what's so interesting is that we just completed our, our second film, uh, The Unholy Sea, and, and right after we completed this film and released it, NASA comes out with this uh, article. It releases these images in, in, in July, last July of 2016, releases these images, and the, and the heading is Morse Code on Mars. 
And the images are allegedly of sand dune uh, configurations uh, on the surface of Mars. These are images that come from the surface of Mars. And uh, NASA plays with the idea in the article that, that this looks like Morse code. This seems to be a language. And what's really, really interesting is that if you look at these images that, Mar that, that NASA released and you look at what we covered in our first film, the geoglyphs of Tiwanaku, in my estimation, we're looking at the same thing. Wow. In other words, if this is indeed a language, uh, as, we, uh, as we believe and as we allege in, in, our, in our film in episode one, then what NASA just released to the public by way of these photos might be confirmation that this language is embedded not only on the surface of the Earth, but also on the surface of Mars and who knows where else. Now, it's one thing to observe a phenomenon. It's another thing to absorb it and to properly interpret it. And you could look at it and say, well, these are you know, just uh, earthworks left by farmers or something. And the thing on Mars, just uh, windblown sand dunes. And, uh, but let's suppose they are intelligently designed designed to be seen from above uh, the plane of Nazca. I think everybody's seen That's the right, yeah. insects, you know, and figures, mm -hmm. you know, that are hundreds of yards long. And have, it cannot be appreciated except from the air. And you look at it and just sort of, well, ho-hum. Uh, that, that, they just, that was their hobby. They just built those things and that they leave it behind. I think we've come to a time now, and this really is illustrated in, in True Legends Part 2, We've come to a time when we need to put these things together and, and infer the larger picture, if you will. That's exactly right. I think that we need to uh, get ahead of this kind of information as believers, and we need to understand how it relates to the text of Scripture, and we, may, we need to make inferences based on that perspective and get a solid footing before we're told what these things are, and before this narrative comes out, that is going to be a very delusive, deceptive narrative. And unless you have your footing firmly founded now, mm -hmm. you're going to be in danger of being swept away because the lie that's coming concerning, concerning these things is, is extremely, exceedingly potent. Now, you talk about giants, unabashedly so. You, you believe that there, there were real giants. And of course, the Bible talks about them. Uh, Goliath and Og of Bashan and and the giants that scared the Israelites so much that they did not want to go into the promised land. And, and uh, I think probably people say, oh yeah, they were probably big warrior type people, maybe seven, eight feet tall. Um, maybe they were that big, but real giants, bigger than that? Probably not. Well, you have found evidence that there were giants. I mean, how, how big were the giants? Well, we've, we've, we have found evidence and are continuing to find evidence that that giants, for example, let's let's deal with Peru, a, a place in specific Peru. Um, we know for a fact that the chroniclers, and we demonstrate this in our first film, that the chroniclers of Peru uh, recorded that the bodies and bones of giants were discovered, unequivocally were discovered. And discovered, and these aren't mastodons and giant sloths. These are. Uh, gigantic humanoid entities with humanoid skulls and fingers and toes wearing jewelry. And dinosaurs don't wear jewelry. So, uh, and, and many of these discoveries were of bodies that were in excess of 15 feet. So 15 plus feet tall. In fact, in uh, our film, our, our, our second edition, episode two, The Unholy Sea, opens up with the testimony of an AC-130 pilot, who's still active duty to this day, uh, who actually transported the body of a recently killed giant out of Afghanistan. And uh, it was uh, out of Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. And uh, he saw the body, he touched it, he pounded his fist on it, uh, he saw the fingers and the toes and the feet that were wrapped in canvas, and... Uh, and he was met there, by the way, when he pulled in with his AC-130. It was a routine mission for him. He didn't know what he was picking up. But as soon as he pulled in and got out of his, air, got out of his uh, aircraft, he was met by what he described to us as the babysitters. And these were uh, uh, military individuals who were accompanying the body of the dead giant. And they informed him immediately, no pictures. Uh, you can't record any information, no making notes about this. 
Uh, this is extremely top secret. And they accompanied the body of the giant all the way to its final destination. And having watched True Legends, and, and by the way, you, you'll be amazed, having watched it, this uh, we're talking giant here. We're, we're not talking the, about somebody eight feet tall. This giant, we... He was estimated to be around 12 feet tall. Now, there's, an, there's other sources out there that are corroborating this story. Hmm. And they say that he was more like 15 feet tall. Our, the, the guy we interview, our pilot says he was, he was at least 10 to 12 feet tall, maybe larger. But we know exactly how much he weighed because they weighed him. Of course. They weighed him <clears> before, <throat> they put the, before they inserted the pallet yeah. that he was laying on, before they inserted it into the cargo bed of the, uh, of the AC-130. And he weighed at least... A thousand pounds. That's how wow. much this guy weighed. So, yeah, this isn't just a big guy. This is a monster. Now, let's uh, suppose, and and I have no problem believing this, that this is a true story. Maybe there are others out there in very, very isolated locations. Where in the world do they come from? Well, the Bible says where they came from. There were encroaching spirits from on high, dark spirits. In fact, uh, I have my little faithful copy of the book of Enoch here, and it talks about a, a, an angel by the name of Azazel who led 200 other angels who came down on Mount Hermon. And they knew they were violating God's law when they did it. You go through the entire book of Enoch, this evil thing that these angels did uh, produced giants. That's right. It, it produced hybrids. That's right. Uh, if you will, human-alien hybrids. Now, this is in the Bible. By the way, the book of Jude quotes Enoch. Directly. So what can I say? We're not talking about some fantasy here. Yeah, and this was, a, this was the common view of the Jews in Jesus' day. So when he would talk to them, and when, and when, and when Peter talks about the angels that uh, kept not their estate but are bound in chains of darkness, this was common knowledge among the Hebrews of that time. And not only among the Hebrews, every, ancient, every major ancient civilization has a similar narrative of the gods, uh, these entities, these beings descending from heaven and commingling with the human race, taking from among the children of men the daughters of men, wives, and copulating with them and producing, as a result, offspring that were not fully human and were not fully of the gods. These were the demigods, and in many cases giants, but not just giants, all kinds of beasts and, and, and creatures, illicit yeah. creatures. These, these, were, uh, these were creatures that came into existence that were not sanctioned by God. They were not sanctioned yeah. to exist. So they were wholly evil. And we see these things in, uh, in rock carvings. We see chimeras, half one animal, half another. Uh, we see all kinds of strange beasts at, that were worshipped by the people of the old world who thought that this was something really great, uh, that these gods had come down and produced all kinds of genetic corruption. And yet God destroyed the whole world. Uh, and then after uh, the flood... Uh, this this thing started once again, and you have evidence that in fact you've you've gone to some amazing places to find evidence that there were giants with high technology of some sort who lived what uh, three thousand years ago, and were building things that are still extant today. Right, and not only giants, but who knows what other kind of entities were involved. Uh, many people are familiar with uh, the elongated skull phenomenon. Right. And we, we deal with that in our film as well. Uh, so there's any number of situations that are plausible regarding the building of the megaliths. But this is a fact. They were built in the world before the flood of Noah. These are not edifices that were raised by the Inca, by Bronze Age civilizations. Uh, the Inca in Peru, the Incan Empire are credited with the megaliths in Peru. And some of the most amazing and massive megaliths on the earth are attributed to, to a Bronze Age level civilization that did not have, that wasn't even in possession of the wheel. And you're talking about uh, <clears throat> people taking copper tools and maybe stone hammers or maybe copper hammers and chiseling andesite and granite, very, very hard, hard rock and making huge edifices. Impossible. Can't be done. Uh, a good part of True Legends involves uh, Timothy's travels uh, to Peru and other places where, and I've, I would love to see these things, probably never get a chance to go and see them, but having seen the DVD, I, I feel like I've been there. 
But th these things have stones of the most unusual size and shape. That how much do they weigh? Well, they weigh hundreds of tons, and these are polygonal stones. In other words, they are multi-shaped and they're randomly shaped. They're randomly shaped in order to fit with the stones that are adjacent. So in other words, a very large block was somehow carved specifically and precisely to fit with the stones that were placed around it. We're dealing with hundreds stones that weigh hundreds of tons. So not only did they have to somehow extract these stones from the mountainside, they had to move them somehow, and then they had to carve them, lift them, set them into place with such precision that you cannot stick a blade between a lot of these mortarless joints. And that's a key, mortarless joints, because there is a technique in the old world. When I say the old world, I mean the world before the flood of Noah, the pre-flood, the antediluvian world, a technique known as cyclopean masonry. And that's a term that comes out of mainstream archaeology, traditional mm. archaeology. Cyclopean masonry, and the reason why they call it cyclopean masonry, which involves the c construction using very large blocks without the use of mortar, the reason why they call it cyclopean masonry is because the Greeks attributed that kind of masonry to the offspring of the gods, ah. which were general generalized in the Cyclops. The Cyclops was an offspring of the gods, and so they called it cyclopean masonry masonry, because it could not have been built, built with human hands. It was built by the offspring of the gods. So in a way, the Greeks corroborate the Bible narrative. They do, in many ways. So you're talking about masonry, and we'll, we'll put up some, things, some uh, shots for you to look at as we're talking here. But uh, a place uh, like Sacsayhuaman, if I'm pronouncing Sacsayhuaman. that. Sacsayhuaman. Sacsayhuaman, which is a, how big is it, the, the whole facility? This well, way? this is the thing about Sacsayhuaman that many uh, people who go and visit, even researchers, don't realize, is that what you're looking at is literally only the tip of the iceberg, which you can actually see at Sacsayhuaman for a number of reasons. Number one, because the Spaniards took apart a lot of the walls, the higher, smaller blocks, they took them apart, and they used those blocks to rebuild, uh, yeah. to build their own, I should say, to, to, to construct their own edifices inside of the city of Cusco, within the city of Cusco. But... That's known, but what's unknown is that, uh, unknown to most, is that the vast majority of that complex is still under the ground. It's buried beneath the sediment of the mountain. In other words, when you look at Sacsayhuaman as it stands today, it's absolutely impressive. It's mind-blowing. But then to consider that you're only looking at a small portion of the, in of the, of the entirety of the complex is absolutely mind-blowing, and it, it, it completely destroys the notion that this thing was built by, um, by a Bronze Age civilization, such as the Inca. And again, they're the ones who are, are attributed with the building of these walls. But the Inca themselves never claimed to be the builders. And in fact, uh, Inca lore points to giants being the builders of those walls, or demons, as, uh, as the Spaniards thought. Wow. Now, as I watch... Uh, a DVD like True Legends 2. Uh, what I'm, what's coming into my mind is we've got information that has been known uh, literally for centuries, but just is just now being brought to light by explorers like you and others who are suddenly publicizing all of this and saying, this can't have been built by humans. There's got to be another explanation. You being a Christian, you're going to find the biblical explanation. And in so doing, I think what you're doing is, at least in my, my case, you're stirring up my excitement. I believe that as this information comes out, it, it's proving to what I already believe, namely that we're living in the last days when this information is going to explode uh, just before the return of our Lord. So I think you're part of that explosion, quite frankly. You're out there doing what needs to be done. Well, it's exciting because uh, we believe that, that, exactly as you said, that, we're, that we are, we are uh, partaking in the uncovering inf uh, of information that has been time-locked, if you will. Yeah. And it's because it's been available. It's been available. Those, the, the, the constructions, these megalithic constructions have been known uh, for, for decades and people have been visiting them. But what's happening now is there's a collective awakening happening, especially among Christians. And they're beginning to connect the dots. 
that when the Bible talks about Genesis 6, when it talks about the sons of God coming and, and taking wives from the daughters of men and then the giants that were produced as a result, that these things were literal and that the evidence in stone and the evidence carved into the earth, in, 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 uh, as we were talking about the geoglyphs earlier, points to this very narrative. Mm-hmm. And, and, in, and in a way, exclusively to this very narrative. And the narrative uh, goes from one end of the Bible to the other. It starts in Genesis, you come to Revelation. The old ones are going to be released in the end times to torment human beings on earth once again. And I think that they will uh, unveil phenomenal powers, the same kind of powers they used to, uh, to create all these enormous projects in the beginning. Uh, they're going to be released as part of God's judgment. The old ones then are about to make their appearance, and I think what we're doing right now is uh, we're in the in the, uh, the the part of history where bit by bit there's a, a disclosure going on. There is. I think we're in the midst of of what could be described as a soft disclosure. In other words, things are uh, being leaked purposely from different institutions, from the Vatican, from uh, also from NASA and different institutions around the earth that are suggesting to the populace that there is something to all of this and it is a, it's, it's the proverbial boiling frog scenario yeah. uh, and, and, and uh, the, 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 the human populace on the earth right now is slowly being acclimated to the idea that we're not alone in the universe, that there's extraterrestrial origins uh, to the human race uh, on the earth, and in my estimation, that's going to be part of the lie that's being crafted uh, even as we speak. And I believe that there's going to be soon, uh, because they're not going to be able to keep a lid on this uh, for too much longer. Right. Uh, because of all the revelations that are happening all over the earth, everybody has cameras now, so when there's a UFO, uh, when there's a, 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 some sort of an object hovering in the sky, you get a dozen people who pull out their cameras with, with high-definition um, video recording capacity on them and they begin to record and instantly upload them to the internet. That's right. So you can't hide this stuff any longer. So what do you do? Do you just come out and tell the people that this stuff is real? Well, then you might, there, there may be chaos, but the most important reason why they wouldn't do that is because they're interested in controlling the narrative. They don't want people to draw their own co- conclusions, especially not conclusions that are derived from the text of Scripture. The Antichrist system then is already in, a, in, in play. That is to say, a, a, a massive worldwide system of propaganda is in play. And by the way, that, that's a big part of this DVD. Uh, we have people on earth now who are looking, they're watching, and they believe, that in fact they have built gigantic instruments which they believe will allow them to see the old ones returning once again. Can you believe what I just said? This is a strange thing to have to utter in public, that there are actually people on earth looking for the arrival of, of the old ones, right. the fallen angels. That's right. And, there, and, and, and what people have to understand in order to make sense of, uh, of those kind of statements, because they are hard to believe, unless you have an understanding that you have, uh, you have, an, you have an echelon, you have a hierarchy in place, you have... Um, the, the Luciferian occult elite who are not only looking for the return of the gods but are trying to catalyze their return, are trying to open gates, are trying to, through sorcery and through all kinds of different uh, illicit means, trying to make contact and bring about the resurrection of the Golden Age, which was the world before the flood of Noah. But then you have uh, um, multitudes of scientific people who are involved in some of these projects, the one specifically that you are referencing is Mount Graham and the Lucifer device. You have all kinds of, right. of scientists working on those, with those telescopes who have no idea that the data that they're collecting is being used by that upper echelon, that occult society, the Luciferian elite, who have completely different designs for the information and the technology that's being developed. So most of the scientists working uh, with these telescopes or working at CERN or working on these high-tech projects uh, are working on them believing that they're just advancing human knowledge or they're trying to develop technologies that are useful to the human race or they're trying to look for exoplanets, which is what they publicly declare about Mount Graham. They're looking for exoplanets where alien life might be possible. 
But I believe that, uh, uh, again, the occult elite, the, 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 the ruling established occult Luciferian elite already know that these things exist. They're not looking for them. They're trying to bring them back. And to become part of the power that they believe will come down. In other words, it's, it's a power grab. Uh, if we can control this, we can control exactly. the world. Well, that's the story of the Antichrist. Exactly, and that's what they, they pledge allegiance to the prince that is to come. Wow. Uh, all this has to do with what the Bible refers to as the, the sons of God who came into the daughters of men. And they, they did horrific things on planet Earth, and they left artifacts all over the face of planet Earth that are being blithely ignored by most people. And I think the reason they're being ignored is because they're very difficult to, uh, to understand in contemporary terms. Well, that's where uh, Timothy Alberino comes in because he is chronicling uh, these ancient earthworks, these ancient megalithic structures, and inferring from that that a number of things must have happened in the past and therefore there are a number of things that we must expect in the future. And I think the near future... Uh, Timothy, I'm holding a book here. This is my own private copy of uh, uh, of a book entitled "Would You Baptize an, an Extraterrestrial?" And it, this is authored by Guy uh, Con- Consolmagno, a Society of Jesus. He's a Jesuit, and he's dealing with the subject: uh, if an extraterrestrial came down, uh, would you baptize him into the Christian faith? Which is now, where in the world would you come up with a topic like that? You'd have to be looking for an extraterrestrial to come down. Expecting. Expecting. Yeah, and I think they are expecting. Uh, in fact, uh, I think they already know a lot of things, and they're, they're just sort of uh, prepping the masses for disclosure. And specifically, the Vatican is beginning to craft uh, a, a, not only a narrative concerning extraterrestrials, but theology. They're, they're, even as we speak, they're creating dogma and doctrines so that when disclosure comes, and when we say disclosure, we're talking about the revelation that the human race isn't alone, that there's other senti- advanced sentient beings, extraterrestrials that are out there and that in fact have been interacting with human beings for millennia. And uh, they are looking for ways and are creating ways to insert this, this narrative into the pages of Scripture. So they're trying to, and they are, accommodating uh, the extraterrestrial narrative into the pages of the Bible. That's something that's already happening. That's not speculative. They're doing it, they're, it's not speculative. They're doing it already on, a, on, a, on, the, on the level of the Jesuits, Opus Dei, and uh, other organizations within the Vatican. Now, the Vatican is well-funded, to, to say the very least. They have a very large treasury. They're capable of doing some incredible work and in conjunction with astronomers and other scientists, they have, to use the old expression, put their money where their mouth is. They yeah. have built some enormously expensive scientific uh, 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 instrumentation, in this case astronomical uh, instrumentation, on Mount Graham in Arizona. Uh, our friend uh, Tom, by the way, who appears in this, in this film, Tom Horn, uh, contributes a great deal to the to the narrative because uh, he's he's gone to Mount Graham and, yep. and actually photographed a strange instrument that they're using to apparently to observe these people that they expect to come back. Yeah, they say that they're looking for exoplanets out there on top of the on top of Mount Graham. Exoplanets are of course planets that have the potential for extraterrestrial life and uh, or for biological life. And so this is what they say. This isn't uh, what, see, what we say. This is what they say. This is the official, uh, this is the official story coming from uh, the, the astronomers up there on, on Mount Graham. And uh, as you said, Tom is in the film. And we have some footage from Tom that I don't think you, anybody has seen anywhere else. At least I haven't. And I haven't either. And I was flabbergasted because you actually film this binocular telescope, a very unique instrument, extraordinarily expensive. It must be uh, multiple millions of dollars to to create this thing, but a binocular telescope specifically designed to look for the return of alien intelligence. 
That's sci-fi. That's, that sounds like a science fiction movie. That doesn't sound like anything real. That's right. And not only are they up there, they're up there on top of the mountain in conjunction with uh, the University of Arizona and other institutions, but not only are they up there watching the stars, looking for exoplanets, and as we know, expecting the return of something or someone, uh, they were very aggressive in their move to take possession of that particular mountain. And we break this down in our film uh, with Steve Quayle, who's the producer of the film, and Tom Horn and myself, and we're telling you why they were so interested in Mount Graham. And uh, basically, in a nutshell, Mount Graham is one of the holiest sites in the world uh, for the Apache Indians. And the Apache Indians believed that there were entities on Mount Graham, and that Mount Graham was essentially a gate, a portal of some kind. And this is uh, information that both Tom Horn and Chris Putnam uh, revealed in their book, Exo Vaticana, uh, that they wrote together some years ago. And so we, 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 are, are the information that we, we've uncovered all over the, year, all over the world in, in terms of the, the, the locations that we visited from Malta to Rome to Sardinia to, to per, various parts of Peru, Bolivia, um, uh, are all uh, pointing to the same idea, that there is something very interesting that was happening in the prehistoric past of this earth. And when I use the term prehistoric, I'm referring to the antediluvian world, the world before the flood of Noah. There was something very unique, very interesting, and very important happening then that the occultists of our modern era, at the highest levels of government and secret societies, are uh, trying to resurrect. They want to resurrect, bring about the resurrection uh, of the golden age. The old ones, I guess. Exactly. And of course the Greeks spoke, or used to speak of, uh, back in Periclean Greece, 300 BC to 600 BC, the Greeks spoke of Greek gods, the old gods, the great gods that came down and blessed humanity. And, and commingled with humanity. And commingled with humanity, absolutely. And, and so we're, we're talking about what used to be considered mythology but now we're looking at as, no, this really happened. And th what are called myths are corrupted stories uh, of actuality. That's right. And we, 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 we talk a lot, uh, um, we, we deal with the Tower of Babel in our film too, in a way that I think uh, people are going to appreciate, because I think we connect some dots that are going to help people who are confused, because there's already this storyline that's been developed out there uh, the, the ancient astronaut theory, it's called, yes. which essentially takes the, the narrative of Genesis 6, uh, the story that the Bible lays out, and twists it, takes out the biblical context, but keeps some of the same elements. In other words, the gods descended, the aliens descended. In some cases, they believe, uh, certain factions believe that the aliens uh, created us, that they genetically modified a hominid, a primitive hominid species on earth to create the human race. In other words, they, they integrated their own genes into this hominid species to And there are certain, create us. certain people on earth right now who are sort of looking for their return to take man to the next level, if you will. That's exactly right. For them, this would be a great thing. For, for us as Christians, it's not a great thing That's at all. Right. And they're actively working towards uh, the coming of those old ones, as you call them, the, the return of the gods, the resurrection of the golden age. And again, this is the, the highest echelon of, of, of uh, occult practitioners and, and, and the Luciferian elite who know exactly what they're dealing with. They're not, they're not looking for exoplanets. They're trying to open the gates through which these entities can come and uh, enter into our dimension and have some level of authority on this planet. Now, sitting here listening to Timothy, I, I'm grappling with ways to try to describe the contents of True Legends Part 2. First of all, it's exquisitely produced. Uh, it's an armchair travelogue that will take you to wonderful places in the world where you will see some amazing sights that you never even dreamed about. It's also uh, a series of conversations with some of the men that, who are expecting uh, the return of, if you will, the old ones. And their instrumentation, and the fact that they're putting uh, a lot of money in, into this operation. It's also, in addition to being a travelogue, it's also a history. Uh, and Steve Quayle, Tom Horn talk about, uh, if you will, the long history, both of uh, the, the geological uh, artifacts 
and the, the, uh, the demigods that once roamed the world. So you're really getting three things in one on this DVD, three stories in one. That's right. This is essentially two films in one. In fact, it was going to be two separate films. And uh, uh, Steve, who's the produ- Steve Quayle, who's the producer of the film, uh, really felt strongly that we need to combine these two together so that people connect, can connect the dots right. from the megaliths and the, and the antediluvian world to the disclosure of, of extraterrestrials and the Vatican and everything that's happening in terms of the theology being laid for, to, to baptize aliens, to receive them yeah. into a biblical context and, uh, and, and they're connected. They're, well, they're, intri- they're intricately connected one with the other, and that's what we really wanted to lay out in this film. And you did it. Congratulations, you did it. I, I have to say, while I'm sitting here listening to you, that you succeeded. <clears throat> it's a wonderful production. Now, I want you to talk about uh, some of the uh, elements of this, uh, of this travelogue, if you will. You went to Malta, and you visited a place underground, and I had no idea that this place existed. It's called a hypogeum, if I'm correct. Hypogeum. And tell us about about what this is and what you saw there. Well, the hypogeum is, uh, I believe, one of many underground complexes. It's the only acknowledged underground complex in Malta, though we know there are more. Um, it is. Uh, con- it consists of underground chambers. There's three levels of chambers that are connected. Um, there are megaliths on the island of Malta, and we show in our film megaliths that are, that are very, very similar to those that uh, we were documenting in Peru wow. because we believe they have the same origins. In other words, the same makers, the same technology, a ubiquitous technology was in play. In fact, you go way out of your way to prove this is a global technology. Exactly. It didn't happen just in one place. Exactly. And so uh, these megaliths that are on the surface of, the, uh, on the surface of, of Malta, uh, which are impressive in size, and, and, and in their technological skill, the way that they were built. However, they were built with sandstone, so they're much, I'm sorry, with limestone. They were built out of limestone, so they're much more eroded than the megaliths that, that you would see in Peru or in Baalbek or in these other places of the earth that are built with basalt and andesite and granite yeah. uh, because limestone is, much, is a much softer stone. But what we found is that people ha- weren't connecting the dots. Even the researchers and some of the discovery and history programs that have featured the island of Malta and have looked at the megaliths were not connecting the dots with the other megalithic sites around the world. That these, in fact, are cyclopean edifices that are related, directly related to the other locations on the earth. In, in, again, in the style that they're built in, in the, the, the size of the blocks and so forth. So, Getting back to the hypogeum, what's represented on the surface of the earth in terms of the megaliths is also precisely replicated under the island of Malta. Wow. In other words, these aren't just crude chambers that are, that are, that are burrowed out of the limestone, the bedrock uh, of, of the island of Malta. These are chambers that are built as exact replicas of what's reflected above the earth. And we believe and prove in our film. That that's not that idea that 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 uh, that mirroring the megalithic constructions that are on the surface under the earth is not exclusive to Malta because we have proof that the same thing was done in Peru, and so the the reality is this, Gary, and this is an astounding reality, that there is a, a massive, hidden, underground world beneath our feet, ancient underground world beneath our feet, consisting of both. Uh, naturally formed and artificially formed tunnels and caverns that are connected in a massive network, global network. A global network. A global <clears throat> network. And, and there's a lot of evidence, by the way, that's presented on the DVD that, that, that really proves this. Uh, this, is, this beggars human imagination. Uh, we've all heard of the mythical, if you will, tunnel that works under the earth, you know, that people talk about and then, well, it never, it turns out, that, no, that was just somebody's imagination. It, it wasn't really true. But when you take us down into the hypogeum uh, in this DVD, there's something happening there that is otherworldly. It's not like you're just in an underground chamber. That's right. And I can attest to that. That's exactly right. Because the sensation that I had in the hypogeum, because I went into the hypogeum, uh, uh, we weren't allowed to film, but we were able to acquire footage of the hypogeum. Uh, when I was in the hypogeum, I, I felt 
it was a very strange, arcane, mystical atmosphere under there. It was, in a word, it felt demonic. Something uh, evil was happening. I, that was my sensation. In mm. fact, when they opened the hypogeum, and, and this is something that, that, that uh, this is a fact that came out. This was a scientific study that was done. When they opened the, opened the hypogeum, when they first opened it, they found that there were hundreds of skeletons, bones, that were sealed inside of it. And it was discovered on accident uh, when they were dr- drilling for wells. And, and the hypogeum, by the way, is just, it, when you go to the hypogeum, it's, it's just in a very inconspicuous place uh, in the middle of the street. You know, it's just like, sort of like a side street in the middle of Malta. You'd never Ooh. know there's anything there. And you just kind of just go into this doorway that looks like a house or something, and, and there you enter into the hypogeum, which is astounding, because how many more hypogeums exist all over the planet? And you're you're speculating that there are a lot more. Yes, there yeah. are. And and when they and, and to get back to what I was saying about when they opened this tomb, um, I'm sorry, when they opened the hypogeum, which was sealed like a tomb with hundreds of skeletons, they discovered, and this is on record, discovered some very unusual skeletons among the rest of the skeletons that were that were entombed there. And some of these skeletons were very, for lack of a better term, alien to a normal, normal human anatomy. We're talking elongated skulls, but very bizarre-looking elongated skulls with really large eye sockets. And, um, and, and we actually have an actual footage of that in our film, I mean, a, a photo in our film. And this is a fact. And those, there were six skulls in particular that actually went on display in the museum in Valletta, in the capital of Malta, that mysteriously went missing. Wow, there it is again. Skulls mysteriously went missing. Now, we've heard this story over and over and over again. Every time somebody finds an unusual ancient artifact, lo and behold, it just disappears. It disappears. Who do you suppose is taking these things away and why? Well, that's the question that everybody wants to know. And, of course, um, uh, not only the, these strange elongated skull uh, skeletons, but also the bones of giants. The que- it begs the question, where are they going? Where are the bones going? Well, we discover, and this is kind of giving you a, a tease for our next installment of our series, Episode 3. We have discovered that there is an underground black market that deals in the trade of these kind of arcane relics from the antediluvian world, including the bones of giants and unusual humanoid entities, but also the vast treasures that are associated with them. Uh-huh. Because many times when these things are discovered, these, especially the bones of giants, the skeletons of giants, they're discovered with vast amount of gold. Now you have my imagination racing. You know, we're back in the world of Indiana Jones. Exactly. Here. But we're also in the world of the Bible. And this is what interest, interests me as a Bible teacher, and particularly a Bible teacher interested in Bible prophecy. And I understand that in the last days, <clears throat> uh, perilous times shall come. Uh, there's going to be an opening up, I believe, of the gates of hell, literally. And you know, you you deal with the, with the word gates in, in this in this DVD extensively. We do a, a gate to a, to a, an ordinary human being on planet Earth like myself is something you open to go into your backyard. Biblical gates, however, have a metaphysical meaning, and there really are gates of hell, right? There are, and uh, Tom Horn actually breaks a lot of that down. He has some amazing insight uh, on the gates of hell and on the, 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 the idea of portals, portals. And, and, and the idea that portals, that we can find the existence uh, of portals in the text of Scripture, at least being referenced or alleged, I'm, I'm sorry, not alleged, but being suggested that there's portals, that, that when we read one thing, what it's really saying is that they were using pharmakia, sorcery, to open gates, and, and Tom deals with that in our film, and, and uh and that's another idea that, that we find all over the place connected with, it's another, it's another situation that we find directly connected with the megaliths and their builders, is this idea that they were opening portals, things were coming up, things were coming through, things were going through these portals, and it's always associated with, uh, uh, with these ancient cultures and megaliths, so it's, it's another theme that we find weaving its way through uh, the Genesis 6 narrative and giants and fallen angels and megaliths and everything associated with it. You know, when I read Revelation 9, uh, I read uh, about an angel sounding a trumpet. 
And John writes, And I saw a star fall from heaven to earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit. So th- this, uh, in, in the Greek, uh, I just happen to know that what this bottomless pit is, it's called phleatros abusos, which means the well shaft of the abyss, the abyss. in Greek. And I'm thinking, what a beautiful picture of what you're talking about. That's right. And actually, one of the things that we also feature in our film, there's so much content in this uh, episode. Uh, We talk about the Tower of Babel. And we talk about the Sumerian myth. And we tell people, which I think will will come as a a revelation to, to many people and will help them understand certain things, is that when you say Sumer, when you talk about the, the Sumerians, what you're talking about is Nimrod ah. and the Tower of Babel and the empire that was formed after the flood, even while the sons of Noah were still alive in the plains of Shinar, the great rebellion that took place in this mysterious thing that happens there in the plain, plains of Shinar where the people are coming together and building a tower, the Tower wow. of Babel and the city of Babel. and The gate of the gods. Exactly. And yeah. in the Sumerian myth, uh, the... Uh, the Sumerian cylinder seals, they tell a story that there is a, that Enki, who is basically the equivalent of Lucifer in the Sumerian myth, is actually summoned from the abyss. They summon him, and they build a temple where they summon him. This, again, this idea of portals. They build a temple, and the temple is called the Abzu. Abzu means the abyss in Sumerian. And even modern archaeologists today believe that the Abzu was the base of the Tower of Babel. Hmm. So we have this, uh, when you start to put these pieces together, you get a sense that uh, the tower, what they were doing at the Tower of Babel was much more than just building a very tall edifice. They were doing something that was more akin to sorcery than just masonry. In fact, what they were trying to do <clears throat> was a- access power. They were trying to get hold of the power that they know exists emanating from the, these fallen ones. And right. I believe that that's still going on today, and I think that's really one of the sub-themes of True Legends Part it is. 2. It is, because... There's a group out there right now that's trying to access this ancient power. That's right. They're trying to, uh, they're trying to reassemble the lost knowledge of the Watchers. And that has been the work of the mystery schools and of the occult and the Luciferian elite for for many hundreds of years. And, and you're talking about a society of people at the upper strata That's, yes. who are well-funded. That's right. And who are really and truly serious about what they're doing. And this is a dark brotherhood of individuals who, who have penetrated into basically every, every major institution in the world that, that pulls any kind of real weight in society, obviously including institutions like the United Nations, but also... Uh, the U.S. government. Also, even Christian organizations have been penetrated by these people. Wow. And they're working collectively as a dark brotherhood, as a Luciferian elite, as an occult society to bring about the resurrection of the Golden Age. And we explain, by the way, what the Golden Age is in our film. They're, they're to reassemble the illicit, lost knowledge of the Watchers that was given to mankind in the world before the flood of Noah, which led, by the way, to the destruction uh, of the flood, one of the reasons why God had to destroy that world. All that you've heard Tim talking about, and i got to say, much, much more is right here in True Legends Part 2. It's a travelogue that will take you to some amazing places, sights, sounds, people, ideas. It'll take you back into ancient history. It'll take you forward into the future. Uh, You'll see uh, plots, subplots, dark, dark themes that you won't believe. All in, in, in this single DVD. Uh, and I guarantee that you will not stop watching this thing. So when you sit in that easy chair and, and uh, make sure that you have a, a cold drink at your elbow, perhaps a munchie or two, because <laughs> this thing will keep you going. I do not exaggerate. It's called True Legends, The Unholy Sea. Uh, it's part two of the True Legends series, yours for twenty four ninety five. Go to the online bookstore, and you'll find it right there, prophecywatchers.com. Uh, also, uh, we're offering this book, True Legends, by Stephen Quayle, <clears throat> and part one of True Legends 
as a package with True Legends 2. These three items are yours for $79.95. You'll find it under True Legends Package when you go to prophecywatchers.com and uh, pull up the online bookstore. You can get either True Legends 2 or the True Legends Package and you'll uh, be entering a brand new world. But I'll tell you what, it's going to help you understand Bible prophecy. And let's talk about your testimony because you're talking here as an explorer, uh, as someone who has seen some strange things in this world, talk to some people who are uh, who have, let's, let's put it this way, a dark side. Uh, and, we, and, and there is a kind of a dark conspiracy going on. But you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe in Bible prophecy. You believe in the truth of the Word of God. I absolutely do. And you put all this together as, as a calling in your life. Yeah, and what really is exciting for me, the most exciting thing, and what we really hope that people draw out of our work, both myself and Steve, is a deeper understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because all of, all of this relates ultimately to that foundational event. The event, as the early church called it, the, the death of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection and, uh, the, the, uh, and the redemption of the human race. And then connected to that is the enemy's plan as he works overtime to do some very interesting things to try to uh, usurp the, what's, what rightfully belongs to Jesus. In other words, the, the, the right. throne that belongs to Jesus. And when you start to put this all together, uh, you get a better picture of the gospel. You do indeed. You absolutely do. It's not a deviation from the gospel. It illuminates the gospel ultimately. And that's why it's, it's so exciting to us. It gives power and presence to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian and you watch this, I guarantee you it's going to change your commitment to Christ. You're going to be uh, your efforts will be redoubled uh, as you study the Word. Timothy, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me again. I'm Gary Stearman. You keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com. 